document. Does it look snooty? No. It again looks very intellectual. Backdrop, the specs. Oh, we are live now. Yes, we are live. <laughs> Good morning, lovely people. We are so happy to be back for the third edition of our live series on complementary and alternative medicine. Welcome to the talk show. Our series on CAM, Complementary and Alternative Medicine, is where we talk about health and fitness, dietary and nutritional well-being, psychoneuroimmunology, like-minded communities for healing and support, and about exploring and making quality of life-centric choices in cancer and other diseases. Today we are in conversation with Vani Pava, founder, Body in Motion by Vani Pava. Welcome to the show, Vani. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Ritu. It's a pleasure. We are so happy to have you here. Looking forward to the conversation. Likewise. Before I start with the introduction, I want to make, I want to give a few pointers to our viewers. In the case of any technical glitch, if the power were to go or for some reason, if the light feed is to die out, we will be back. We will be completing the show. If it's okay with Vani, we might just go a few minutes over 12 o'clock if that's okay, Vani. Yeah, sure. That's so something will, you can't control. Can't. Thank you so much. So we will definitely complete the show. Stay with us. We will be back in a few minutes if that was to happen. There will be a question and answer session. We will take all your questions. Please put them down in the chat or the comment section of the live stream that you're watching. Uh, they will be collected and sent to Vani. Vani will address them at the end of the show. So please keep putting them down as and when they come to your mind. For the introductions, I am Ritu Gupta. I am CEO of CAPIT, Cancer Awareness Prevention and Early Detection Trust. We are an organization that has been working, as the name suggests, for cancer awareness and prevention. If you have been following us on social media, you will know that we work primarily in the area of cervical cancer. We are a grassroots NGO and we have been in the field for a little over six years now. So far, we have stayed with mainstream information and awareness on cancer prevention and care. Even when we do talk about general cancers, we go with what is the mainstream information. In these last few years, we have reached out to over 19 million people and we have screened 13,000 women and counting. Our responsibility to create a wider worldview of cancer care is something that we are now looking at quite seriously. So we have taken it upon ourselves to broaden our discussions to include other tried and tested interventions and new alternatives in the healing space. We just feel that if you had to make a decision for yourself or your loved ones, you should have a little bit more information and it is our responsibility now to bring that out to you. We've had one talk in the beginning with Mr. Vijay Bhatt and he covered stressors and strengths and healing the person as a whole, which was a wonderful conversation. We had another talk with the founders of Love Heals Cancer and ZenOnco.io. It is the first integrated oncology app in the country. <clears throat> the interviews are available on YouTube and our Insta pages. You're welcome to go and see, read, see, hear them there and be connected with the entire series if this is your first time with us. Our third guest on this journey of information is Vani Pahava. Vani is a wellness entrepreneur and coach who dons multiple hats. With close to two decades of diversified experience across health, fitness, wellness, rehab, sports, and lifestyle techniques at a holistic level, she is a well-recognized exercise and rehab specialist and one of the country's first cancer exercise specialists. She is also a performing Indian classical dancer, Moini Attam, and performs nationally and internationally. So tell us, Vani, where and how did all of this start? Uh, thanks, Pradhu. Uh, it's actually a very long journey and it's uh, organic, but somewhat a chaotic journey as well to reach where I am today. I've always been, you know, a very physically oriented person. The last bit of my description would say is that I'm a classical dancer. So I started dancing at a very, very young age. I was not even five years old. So that, you know, that really laid the groundwork and it also dictated the space that movement and uh, particularly what today we call holistic movement occupies uh, in my life, in my thought process. And then over a period of time, what happened was that, you know, life takes multiple turns. I landed up in Gurdaw, nuclear family, blah, blah, blah. Uh, dance had to take a little bit of a backseat. And this also coincided with a couple of... Uh, 
personal developments in terms of injuries, in terms of certain ailments, you know, where gradually movement started getting taken away from my plate. And uh, every time the prognosis was that I'm not going to be able to do A, B, C, and slowly it started going to X, Y, Z in my life. And like I said earlier, movement is, uh, you know, very, very central to me. Movement is my meditation. It's what stabilizes me. And uh, taking no for an answer was not an option, again, because of the mental uh, fortitude that movement provides me. And that's how I slowly started getting to breaking personal barriers. And along with that, that was not hit and trial. I did a lot of study. I did a lot of pursuit of uh, solutions. And that's how I landed up doing my certifications. And then along the journey, my uh, training other people started and I started getting more and more serious. What was organic was, I guess, because of the fact that, you know, in a lot of cases, it was a case of been there, done that with terms of recovery. I started uh, resonating a lot with clients. And slowly, the kind of references that started coming to me were no longer the fit people or the uh, elite athletes. I also started getting a lot of people who were looking for solutions for something very basic and functional with their lives. There was a functional deficit that some ailment, that some injury was creating. And they started reaching out to me. Uh, and that's how probably, uh, you know, cancer also happened because uh, in my family, there's a huge history. We have all kinds of cancers. We have all kinds of diseases. I'm probably a doctor's delight or a nightmare because when they ask me for my medical history, I always say, it'll be faster if I tell you what we don't have. In the <laughs> and my own mother, you know, I had seen my own mother. She was a patient of multiple sclerosis and a very, very severe uh, one at that where she was completely paralyzed for 14 years and including her vocal cords. And a very bright, a very sharp-minded woman, but, you know, reduced to a vegetative state. And she continued like that. So I think somewhere deep down, that kind of embedded itself in my psyche that, uh, you know, to the extent that it is possible for a human being to rise above their station, rise above their limitations, we all must, we all should, because life is meant to be lived. Unless you are really passed down a sentence over which you have zero control. Even if you have 0.1% control, you owe it to yourself as a human being to exercise that control. Uh, you know, you don't live, live a defeatist life. You have to live it on your terms, whatever those terms, whatever little those terms may be. And that's something that's taken to my journey. And here I am today. And today it's a vast range of people that I deal with. And on a personal note, Mridu, I will also say, you know, what it does to me mentally as a person, it really grounds me because on one end, we have the athletes who have competitive goals and that's their functional fitness because they're wanting to get better and better. And other hand are people who are probably just wanting to stay off a wheelchair or probably wanting to not be so dependent on their caregivers to have some semblance of self-respect, some semblance of self-love and control over their lives. So it's really a vast journey that I travel on a daily basis. And I think it grounds me and it That's really makes me respect and love life for whatever it is, whatever it issues out. Truly, that's really beautiful. And some of the best stories come from personal adversities. So it's like converting those adversities into <clears throat> something that, you know, you can work with and do. And I understand when you say that at one end, it is merely staying off the wheelchair we were speaking to the other people earlier and everybody talks about how you have got to own your your problem you've got to own the disease the disease should not own you so that's somehow taking control of the disease is at least bringing back certain movements certain things to your uh, body and you know whatever you can control you'd want to control so giving them the power to do that must be really empowering must be really liberating for the people to be able to get to that point i think uh, that would be wonderful. But so what exactly is body in motion about? And I mean, I understand when you say that it's really important for them, but what is the importance of that in disease? And what exactly is body in motion? I mean, is it like the so, yoga and the things that you talk about? What is it? Uh, well, yes and no. And I would just like to give Leah a little groundwork on, you know, where I came upon the tagline of body in motion, you're all you need. 
for my programs. Uh, you know, on a personal scale, uh, what is it that really feeds me, nurtures me is nature. And what is it about nature that is so appealing? And I think this would be true for a lot of people. Maybe they've never questioned it, voiced it or realized it. But what is so soothing about nature? You know, it's the murmur of a stream when you see water gently flow past. Uh, when the leaves rustle, when the wind blows, there's a sense of optimism around you. When the clouds roll past in the sky, all of this in nature is movement. There is rhythm in nature and that is what is life. And that is something, you know, why do we say hit nature, go out into nature to rejuvenate yourself? You are actually seeking out a life pattern. You're seeking out a flow, a rhythm, and that is motion in nature. And as far as the body is concerned, well, the body is in motion all the time. Uh, even our circulatory system, our respiratory system, our breathing, that is air in motion. When breathing stops, prana stops, life stops. So, you know, what is it that eventually we go for? If you, you spoke about yoga, it's all about a flow. And the whole thing is about flowing your physical countenance with your mental and your emotional state. And that's how I came up with body in motion. It doesn't, uh, I never uh, had this myopic interpretation that body in motion means that you need to exercise. It's movement that I focus on. Movement can be interpreted as exercise. Movement can be rehabilitatory. Movement can be celebratory in nature. But movement it is. And, you know, like uh, from a pre present development, if I may draw the analogy, the human body is a very, very powerful machine. There has to be a reason why nature has designed the human body the way it is. There are just so many processes. And certainly, it is not meant to be just sitting and rotting in one corner. Is designed for movement and your body is also your biggest ally uh, but it also turns into your biggest enemy mm. I think which is the context of today's conversation so you have to restore and you have to seek that flow and uh, it'll tie in with your mental and your emotional state as well that's a beautiful thing so you're right uh, the breeze just Standing around is not really breeze. When it, that's only when it flows. That's yeah, that stifles you. you. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's only when it flows that it has this lovely yes. feeling that you write poetry around it and things like that. You know, it's yes. it's all of that. You're right. It's all the motion that actually makes the difference. Beautiful. And stagnant water is probably the worst thing. But flowing water, flowing water. is the, yeah, it's the beauty of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, that's what your organization is about. It's about movement, right? Yes. So it's actually um, an umbrella name to a series of programs. And why I call it an umbrella name is because of the uh, very diverse nature of clientele that I service. Hmm. The bottom line remains the same. The bottom line is to give you functional confidence and functional control over whatever it is that you are seeking and whatever challenge you are trying to overcome. So it is basically body in motion. Even if it's corporate programming, what is a corporate? It is a subtotal of its entities, right? There are multiple people coming together and each one needs to flow. So that's why the name came about. Okay. So your, your organization is a series of, I mean, what you do is different workshops for body in motion. So different Somebody programming? Different, different programs. programs. Yes, oh, okay. different programs. So uh, if we talk about this in cancer, how does it help? people with cancer, at what stage of cancer do they start this and when do they come to you? What is the whole, uh, how is this associated with cancer? Is it before, is it, I mean, is it when you're diagnosed? Is it somewhere down during surgery? Is it post-cancer? How is it a part of cancer care? Okay, so it is pretty much a part of cancer from even the before cancer stage. And I will split up uh, your question into three parts because it addresses three different stages. Uh, of course, I don't really need to lay the groundwork for, you know, how exercise is very beneficial or movement is very beneficial in helping you stay healthy. Cancer is one of the conditions that uh, exists. Okay, so I'm not going to make cancer a very big deal in the uh, pre-cancerous stage where you don't have cancer and where I, as a person, tell you it's good for you to exercise. But there are enough studies and empirical evidences that show that there are uh, particular kinds of cancers certainly 
that it is possible for the human body to uh, delay or avoid them if you follow an overall healthy lifestyle, a lifestyle of movement, right? Uh, now, when you have cancer, when you're diagnosed with cancer, during cancer and post-cancer, at the outset, I would like to clarify and give a small disclaimer that all the exercising or all the physical movement that you will do will be subject to, of course, one, your doctor's clearance, and secondly, your capability at that stage where you're fighting the cancer. However, there is enough groundwork for you to be seeking movement, to be seeking exercising, even when you are in cancer treatment, even when you have been diagnosed, because cancer treatment, uh, quite like cancer, also leaves a lot of damage inside the body. You know, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, hormonal treatments, medicines, surgery, yeah. surgery. Uh, surgery particularly will leave a deficit. Even ordinary surgery leaves uh, postural imbalances and functional deficit. Right. Cancer surgery probably will be a more severe version of that, right? So even when you've been diagnosed, uh, within your ability at that particular stage of handling cancer, it is recommended for you to have some kind of a movement pattern. One, because it gives you a physical advantage. And secondly, going back to what I had said earlier, it gives you a huge physiological, psychological, and emotional advantage. This is something that really allows you to get a modicum of control over yourself when everything is spiraling out of control for you. There are, you know, uh, body image issues. There are defeatist mental issues. You don't know what to do. There is cancer fatigue. There are a whole lot of symptoms that you're battling. So at a purely physical level, uh, movement and exercise will help you to even mitigate a little bit of your cancer symptoms and help you cope better. Post-cancer, again, depending upon the kind of treatment that you've had and the kind of, uh, say, uh, the rest phase that you have been recommended, you need to start pushing past that. Because particularly if you've had surgery and there is a lot of cutting and pasting that's happened for reconstruction. Just imagine, for example, I'll give an example of breast cancer. Now, if tissue, breast tissue has been removed or a mastectomy or a breast reconstruction has been done. Now, this is not like as if an artificial breast has been uh, taken and planted on you. Muscle is drawn from somewhere inside. Flaps are made to give you a little bit of a structuring. Where is all of that coming from? From your own tissues. So imagine if there's so much of tugging, pulling, cutting, pasting, stitching going on, there is bound to be some kind of a tightness. There is bound to be some kind of development of scar tissue, and which is what happens for women. The shoulder, your mobility in your shoulder tends to go. Uh, you know, you experience a great loss in flexibility and mobility in your overall arm. And the sooner you start with the mobilizing exercises, the better is your prognosis to regain and perhaps even reverse to a great extent the limitations that are imposed by the treatment and the disease. So at all stages, it has its place, provided you do it in a safe, structured, and an intelligent manner. But it should be done. It needs to be done. Wonderful. That sounds so practical and aligned with how it goes, but you don't really hear doctors telling you to go to a cancer exercise specialist, and you don't hear people talking about cancer exercise specialists. So yes. what is the... What is the gap in understanding and uh, implementing this area of healing? Where is the gap? Where, why hasn't it just... Uh, you know, again, I think there are two major aspects to this. Uh, one, because uh, even though the awareness of exercise as an empowering tool for your health and for your quality of life is there, People don't adopt it even in the best of circumstances. Even healthy people, you can keep giving them all the uh, evidence and you can, you know, encourage them and you can motivate them, but they don't choose it, right? Absolutely. Cancer particularly has, uh, uh, you know, a very serious and a very defeatist attitude that comes with it. The whole, whole ecosphere with cancer is so intimidating. Uh, you are already grappling with so much. And the awareness of exercise for cancer for many people seems counterintuitive. Uh, you know, the first question you get is, what? I'm already struggling to get out of my day-to-day -day life. I'm struggling to even get out of bed. And you're asking me to exercise, right? That awareness needs to be built. The good news, Mridu, about that is, uh, you know, this awareness is uh, not lacking just in India. 
it is only slowly building up even in the West too. But the difference is that, you know, the doctors there are probably more tuned to this, so they do encourage the patients more. I guess here with our medical setup and with the huge numbers, it's just the case of population. And uh, I really don't want to delve into why a hospital may not offer that. Physiotherapy is offered for cancer. Exactly. The thing with physiotherapy is that, you know, what happens to the patient after the physiotherapy sessions are over? They come back to the home setting. And then they suddenly feel at a loss and intimidated. They don't know how to really structure it into a routine. And the physiotherapy might probably involve assistance from a physiotherapist. Uh, there might be certain equipment that might be used. But how are you empowering or how are you teaching this cancer patient to carry on with that exercise regimen when they go back to their home? They may, they may not have caregivers who can assist them. So there is this huge lacuna that a cancer exercise specialist can uh, fulfill. Then the second thing is the fear factor, like I told you. There's a lot of pain that comes with cancer. There's a lot of pain that comes with right. surgeries and with treatment, etc. So, you know, this fear of that when you do something and you're trying to push past and you get a little bit of a discomfort or a physical pain, the panic button gets pressed mm -hmm. and they have nowhere to turn to. Uh, who's going to guide them? Uh, lymphedema is a you know, very real contraindication, but lymphedema is a term only very few people will recognize. So a cancer exercise specialist like me will probably be just a step ahead in being aware of various kinds of cancers. What are the treatment methodologies? What are the contraindications? And what are the movement patterns that I can empower my cancer patient or survivor with and leave them with a very practical solution that they and the caregivers can practice on a daily basis? and get back on track. So this is the main uh, difference. Uh, <clears throat> I've had conversations with doctors. They say it's a fabulous thing you're doing. But uh, to institutionalize it, we are a long way away from there. Oh, wow. Long way away from there. Unless you have your own cancer hospital and you kind of plug it in into the services. But for somebody like me who's just a purebred specialist, mm, it's a very tough task. It's an uphill task. A lot of people have said that that would actually be a dream to have an integrated cancer hospital where people can do mainstream and they can do all the other alternative and the, the other ways of healing themselves and everything can come together. Because, of course, a cancer patient cannot do without the mainstream. I mean, you definitely yes. need your diagnosis, you need your treatment, but you also need this other support. That would actually have, will be ideal, but when we can get to it is a... Is of course so, you know, this support, Medu, this support, also one of the reasons why I guess it doesn't get its due is because you and I, we call it a quality of life index support. Mm. Whereas the main system is only talking about a very quantitative kind of a support. Right. Yes, survival. 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 That's a survival mode, right? Yeah. We cannot, I don't want to discredit that. That's a huge, very huge aspect. But what happens so, to the survivors post that stage? Correct. We definitely want people to uh, have a quality of life, no matter what physical ailments they are under. You have, yeah. And that's what makes but it the, different. Yes, but the concept of let me just make it through this is, um, I mean, that's the biggest thing during cancer. I, I know because yes. my, I mean, I lost my mother to lung cancer, which is where CAPED and all came about. The whole thing is about being able to make it through this stage. Let me get through this chemo. Let me get through those 21 days to the next chemo. It's all like just to the next phase. So this whole thing about quality of life, you can you think when you sit back. Or if you have somebody who can guide you through it very gently and you take away the fear and help you to see a bigger picture. Otherwise, it's just everyday yes. survival. Is and to at. tap into your words, you know, when I say quality of life, quality of life is inclusive of the expression that you used. Let me just get through this. This is a tool that can help you probably get through yeah. this even better. better. That's but it is not, it is, this awareness is not there. Correct. So That's you're true. just, you're just getting through with whatever it is and you have not allowed yourself this option because you're not aware of it. That's right. So the awareness is something that we really want to spread because I know that I hadn't heard of CAM when I was running around with mom. Nobody told us about it. And I had no clue that there was any other way to handle this than what the doctors were telling me, which is the reason why I think awareness through multiple um, avenues needs to be brought into the open. But you mentioned something about cancer fatigue. Can you tell us something more about that? What, what exactly is so, cancer fatigue? Uh, 
Fatigue is something which we are all uh, aware of and which we've all experienced in our day-to-day -day right. life when you get tired with your activity. Cancer fatigue is, uh, you know, uh, your body's, I would say, heightened response to one, the cancer itself. Uh, the fatigue is a heightened response to the cancer and to the treatments, particularly if you've had some kind of a radiation or a chemotherapy. A lot of tissue, a lot of cells do get damaged in that. Uh, the body's internal systems slow down and there is a little bit of a side effect or a negative effect that adds to this fatigue. So that kind of a fatigue for a cancer patient often can be that um, even probably just getting out of bed to brush their teeth, uh, you know, even to get out of bed. So that's a totally different level of fatigue we're talking about than say you and I, where we say I am just so tired today and I yeah. feel like putting my feet up or my, don't want to my do feet anything. Up. I don't want to do anything. Yeah. But that's, that's a very different and that's a very intense kind of a fatigue. So that is the fatigue that uh, somebody like me needs to be aware of to differentiate that fatigue from the regular fatigue to work around it and to help a cancer survivor push through it, counterintuitive as it may sound, that a little bit of movement, a little bit of an exercise is actually going to help you cope with the fatigue. It's pretty much the same principle. We say that if you're a very deconditioned person, you know, the first time you exercise, a lot of people give up and say, whoa, that's ah. not what I expected from exercise. Yes. Your muscles just woke up. Mm -hmm. But with cancer, it's a whole different ballgame with the fatigue, but they need to kind of push through it so that it eventually helps in the fatigue coping. So you're talking about this fatigue as being something that is physical? I mean, it is uh, a physical Physical problem, right? and mental. Because the mental fatigue uh, is a very huge factor in cancer. So tell us how that is related. Yes. Because you mentioned the cells and everything, the tissue actually being having distress so it's a physical fatigue yes we all get that how is the how does it relate so, to uh, you know the way the human body is designed i know we like to call it an alternative approach and i know we like to call it a different approach but i take a differing stand what i'm about to say according to me is the only approach where your physical and your mental state coexist and have to be worked upon simultaneously uh, you know, when we talk about the fitness industry or we will talk about exercise in general, the perception is that we are only talking about the physical realm. Okay, uh, to a certain extent, most of the people are, but your emotional state, your mental state is uh, does not exist in isolation. The day you are depressed about something, the day you feel intimidated about a life's occurrence, there is a direct bearing on the way your body behaves, isn't it? You start feeling physically tired. Likewise, if you're constantly in pain or you are in a protracted illness, it has a huge corrosive element on your mental and your emotional state. And it's like a feeder system. Uh, you know, it's, I wouldn't even call it a horseshoe. I would call it a full circle because you just get trapped in that ring and physical and mental fatigue then just start building, feeding and sucking off each other. So for a cancer patient, when I say fatigue, the mental fatigue is also a very big thing because cancer is a very intimidating diagnosis to be handed down. Uh, financially draining, physically draining, emotionally draining, you're grappling with a lot. Then on top of that, your body, your body systems, your body responses uh, just don't seem to be obeying you like they used to earlier. That gives rise to a lot of mental stress and that can manifest a lot in your physical state as well. You need to, you need somebody to, that is the role of a caregiver, isn't it? They not only just yeah. watch out for your physical symptoms, they also need to keep mentally pushing you, egging you to do that little basic. Constantly. Yeah. Constantly. So going. that fatigue is also something that one needs to be mindful of. And I would say, not just for cancer, but cancer specifically, your body only does what your mind asks it to do. Even Absolutely. for a fit person. Absolutely. So... It has to start from here. When, when people talk about fitness, I always say fitness starts from here and fitness starts from here. You have to get this going along with your body. You can't be chasing physical fitness and saying that I am getting healthy and, you know, you are frustrated in life. You're not working upon your emotions. You're not working upon your mental state. You're going nowhere with all that jumping around. So everything has to be working together like an ecosystem. Yoga is given as a, you know, I'm just talking about the 
very common questions that come my way where people say yoga is very holistic 100% it is very holistic it's a very ancient science but what i am telling you and leading with you is that any exercise any physical modality it's up to you to make it holistic even if you're doing your regular working out or a walk it's up to you whether you want to be just chatting away in the walk or whether you want to be focusing on your breathing and centering and what is it that's so calming about exercise when does exercise become calming when you have tuned in mentally and when you get the mental and you get the emotional benefits as well so everything ties in for a cancer patient even more that fatigue coming back to your question is as much mental as physical and sometimes mental outweighs the physical i think that cancer fatigue is it rubs off on the caregiver as well i think the caregiver Absolutely. also needs somebody Absolutely. to motivate them and to keep them moving and it is the same thing but uh, <clears throat> even a healthy person you might take a gym membership and go to the gym only 10 days in the month i mean for some reason you don't just keep up with the exercise and something like that and a cancer patient can justify it you know you can say that i am weak or i am not able to do it so is there some some kind of a criteria for somebody to come to you or to continue with their exercise is it okay to give in to your mindset or your mental stress are you working on the mind separately or is it just i mean are you do you just hope that they come for their exercise and then you work on them through mind and body is are you handling so, both uh, the areas different yes um no um let me answer that you know uh, why would somebody come to me the question is somebody would probably come to me where they realize that they need to do something but they're not being able to do it on their own so that's i'm i would say that's coming from a mental space so where they are already aligned to wanting to yeah, do something for themselves probably probably the fatigue is getting too much for them and okay. probably you know sometimes you really have to sink really low and the only way to go is up yes. so probably exercise is sort of that stage you know irrespective as long as they're seeking an option and as long as they're seeking a positive solution i'm okay with it when they come to me uh, i definitely need to understand of course the physical condition i also need to understand the mental condition i can teach them an exercise they can work out under me but the point is that till the time they don't go back feeling mentally positive emotionally positive and they don't go back feeling uh with the faith that they have a comrade in me who's probably going to you know also keep pushing them positively to keep up with it they're not going to come back to me they're not going to come back to anybody so i i have to work on both simultaneously i i never demarcate that first let me work on your mental state then i will hit you physically sometimes i may just even start mobilizing them physically with a chat going on which is tapping into their mental state and by the time we finish and i just tell them that do you realize what we did today and there's a wow factor that i always thought that i would never be able to even do this basic thing so it's a very amorphous but a very complementary way uh, you know how i operate with it so it's more fluid it just everything gets handled all together right whether so it is fluid mental. it is fluid it is not boxed or demarcated or compartmentalized so yeah that's wonderful so these days with digital virtual now with the corona coming up for the next couple of years we are going to be really really careful about getting out and being in groups and things like that i mean whatever is the answer it is going to be everybody talks about how life has become more sedentary now than it was even 10 years ago so what do you see in your field in your area considering exercise what do you think is the best way to move forward what kind of exercise in one's life how does one stay healthier how do we keep the body in motion with the kind of demands that uh, life has on us now and whatever the new normal is going to be what would you say so um, you know i've had uh, two diverse observations of course there are people who still continue to choose to be sedentary uh, with the corona induced uh, new reality of being stuck at home and social distancing there were many who were well going to the gym earlier and because now they cannot physically go to the gym yeah maybe they're not exercising but uh, coming back to the same analogy that i gave with the cancer patient there are many who are probably 
hitting very low depths with their mental and emotional state with the uncertainty. Jobs are at stake. Businesses are at stake. You know, uh, health is at stake. So many people are slowly now reaching out and asking that I'm confined in the home. What can I do? And that's where home workouts uh, bases what you have available at home. And have you been used to any movement earlier, etc. or not? So starting with gentle uh, mobility exercises and then slowly structuring them and giving them a pattern that this is this is the space available to you. This is what you can do. And really, like I say, you are all you need. The human body is such a fabulous piece of equipment to work with, you know, body weight exercises. You don't necessarily need an external source to uh, as a source of resistance. That is needed, but in the times it's not available to you, body weight exercises are such a fabulous way of building and maintaining and sustaining your fitness. So people are reaching out for those solutions and I am offering it back to them. And this you is all offering that. I mean, I'm offering that. And it is very, very mindful of uh, what is available to you. We are all stuck at home, but not everybody has the same size of home. Not everybody has a lawn outside. Uh, some people may be, you know, too many family members in a small space. Obviously, for you and I, if we have a room to ourselves, I can give a different exercise prescription. But for people who are with, you know, with family all around, it would be silly on my part to tell them that, ask everybody to move aside while you're doing this. Then it has to be a very family-centric approach that I have to give them there. The family gets involved and kind of everybody is encouraging each other and nobody says, get out of my way. I have work to do. Hmm. So, uh, if somebody had to reach out to you, how would they do it? Do you have a website they come to? Do you have an email ID they can send? Because if you give it to us, we can put it out in the chat yes. if people are watching just now. So, my website is uh, www.bodyinmotion.in and uh, people, you can go there, you can leave in a comment there. Otherwise, they can reach out to me on contact at bodyinmotion.in. So, people... Did you, yeah. did you get that limit? Should we write it out in the chat section for you? Uh, if you could just share it across the other platforms, he's gotten it. Yeah. So you and you know, the thing, Ridhu, is that I think because of the uh, kind of people that I deal with, particularly those who have health conditions, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, cancer, uh, these people cannot come down to the studio on a daily basis. Exactly. So I have been doing online uh, support and online training uh, with them for years, even before the COVID-induced reality, because that was a necessity. Mm. It's a way of hand-holding when a person cannot physically come to you, but they need your support. And they can do it remotely. Whatever they can do it remotely. Uh, you know, it's like, a, like we are having a session right now where I oversee it and, uh, you know, they feel comfortable that I'm able to do the posture uh, spotting. I'm able to guide them. They and the caregivers do whatever is prescribed. And I am there online for an hour or whatever, half an hour that they're capable of exercising and I guide them that this is what we do now and to, uh, next week, this is how we go on. So this is something I was going to ask you. We are talking to you about cancer, but what are the other diseases that you, uh, or uh, diseases or whatever, what are the other areas that you would be able to support people in? So I already have uh, people who are afflicted with multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, and uh, I have one Alzheimer's uh, patient who's doing this. And of course, people who have other health related issues like uh, diabetes, thyroid. But those are a different category. Those are also lifestyle diseases, but I would not really call them debilitating movement wise. Okay. They are able to move, but it's a choice on their part to not seek out movement. Cancer, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, these have very, these impose physical limitations on a human being so these different categories are there okay. so that means people with any kind of an ailment or even if they do not have an ailment they can reach out for a structured home exercise um, information from you or a system from you or maybe they can learn do something from you so there are lots there's a lot of scope for everybody to kind of yes. get in touch with you so i was going to ask you a question but somebody has already asked that so let me just take this question from here and uh, so this is something to do with what I asked you earlier about yoga. There is somebody who says, what are the ancient health and fitness practices and how are they different from modern practices? Uh, see, most of our ancient practices, which have now become the flavor, the international flavor, 
for the past number of years are very holistic sciences. Uh, yoga, even our martial arts for that matter, be it Kaleri Pet or be it any of the other practices that you see, most of them stem from a Gurukul system. The Gurukul system is, you know, where you are in a very intimate um, space with your Guru who just teaches you not the, not just the physical uh, okay. intricacies or the modalities, but also teaches you the whole philosophy, the rationale. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is a way of thinking. Any science is also an art in the way you approach it in thinking. So yoga and our ancient sciences are very holistic. They've always worked on all the pillars of our fitness. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. spiritual. All of them. Yes. And spiritual. All of them. So our sciences are very heavy on all four pillars. And all four pillars get erected simultaneously. And then the base is built. Western was for a very, very long time uh, driven, I would say, by just the physical aspect. And only when they started waking up, and I unabashedly say this, when they started waking up and uh, started realizing what is it so holistic and what is it about so all-encompassing about yoga, today yoga has become so international. Today you have so many kinds of yoga out there, right? But we still have the advantage, I would say, of the, the spiritual pillar. It's a part of a psyche. It's a part yeah. of a culture. I was just going to say that, that the yoga that is being taught all over the world is still only physical. They're not really addressing the other areas. And now I would say the latest buzzword is, you know, uh, mental wellness, emotional wellness. But we have had it for centuries with us. We've not respected it. We have not celebrated it the way it should have been done. And that's purely our fault. We've, we've taken very readily whatever has been dished out to us with an international stand for that flavor. But we have not given due credit where it belongs, right in our own backyard. So how is that different, different from modern? I mean, we are now using the modern practices. Even if we are doing yoga, we are doing it in the modern way. So, or the so, exercises that you are doing are more modern. So where is the balance? I mean, uh, the, the advantage with modern, it's everything about modern is... Uh, I would say not without value. The advantage with modern and the reason why it has gone so big uh, in the modern uh, frame is the explanation and the presentation. Now, some may argue that that is not important. It's only about content. I disagree. You have content. How do you make somebody uh, understand that content or how do you make that content appealing to the masses? That is something that the modern world has done brilliantly. And that is something that we really need to learn from them. Correct. The explanation, also the scientific explanation. You know, we have the science, but probably we've not been able to explain it very well in simpler terms. That is what they have done. And that is one thing because I myself have so many international certifications, but I come from the traditional system myself. They both have the benefits. And I would really like that our traditional systems are able to... Uh, imbibe a little bit of this learning how do you package it and how do you sell it and when i say package and sell it i don't mean it in a very dismissive sense it's important the way very i important you uh, the way i try and tell you that this is important for cancer my ability to convince you is probably going to make a lot of difference for a few Absolutely. people who are watching it if i just say that look this is the statistics this is what it is this is ancient this is modern but I don't convince you. That is my art of selling to you. That is something we really need to brush up on. It's very, very important. I and agree. You, can, you can marry the two. Like I said, I don't like to follow this, uh, uh, you know, what do you call, uh, walking a black or a white line. This is modern, so I shun it. This is traditional, so I accept it. To pick merge up. them. Yes, pick Create up what is good. Yeah. Create yeah. a balance between yeah. them. I remember uh, Shri Shri Paramahans Yogananda saying in one of his books, he says that we have the honey, but they have the beehive movements. Yes. They understand how to put it all together and yes. how to spread it and what to do. But we have the actual honey. So we've got to yes. marry the two if we really want to get this out into the world. So we've got to take it there and we've got to make them help us get it out. Otherwise, yeah. we will lose yes. it. And just lamenting and just, uh, uh, you know, pulling it down is not going to do it for us. Yeah, that's we, we have to rise up. We have to accept gracefully what is missing. And we really need to imbibe it and we need to develop it on our own. And you're a Mohini Atam dancer as well, right? You're a performer. 
and that's an ancient art and you are an exercise specialist who's got certification in the modern exercise uh, patterns so you are marrying the two absolutely. in your own life you are absolutely. creating a balance between uh, them. we talk about yoga but for me uh, the indian classical dance forms are uh, probably one of the world's oldest holistic systems of exercise if you want to call it that for the sake okay. of this discussion it's not just a holistic system of exercise it's a holistic way of living because you're not just uh, learning the physical choreographies and the physical uh, modalities you are learning so much more about it and particularly a style like mohini atam for those who have seen it you know uh, it's a very deceptive style where there's a lot of grace there's a lot of flow it totally belies the control the physical control a dancer is exercising there are no jerks unlike some other styles where the display of power is very visible it's explosive so you know you feel that okay there's so much the dancer is doing so much energy so much yeah, energy yeah. but but when we have dancers from those styles coming and trying out mohini atam the first thing they say is i never realized that there is so much demand on a dancer's body so the beautiful thing about mohini atam one is the physical aspect the second thing is and it ties in so beautifully with the discussion we are having ridu is that you know it's a flow grace can never come from a body which is stuck up or from a mind which is stuck up so you have to let go you have to really let go when you're doing mohini atam for the body to flow gracefully there is just so much that i carry from that style to my life and to my exercise physiology and the way i tie physical mental and of course spiritual are all our classical styles are absolutely yeah, yeah. seeped and mired in the spiritual there's no escaping there's it no, when you yeah. grow up in that ethos it has to color the way you think live perceive life exactly so i think and that would obviously make a difference in everything that you're putting out whatever it may be whatever you so are so body in motion the flow call, uh, also somewhere deep down i think my association with dance and maybe that's the reason why i uh, look for these analogies in nature as well and probably that's where it came from yeah. the flow yes beautiful right so there's somebody else asking a very similar question maybe we can address it again for them what is the significance of this training with respect to injuries and other health issues Uh, what training are you talking about not training would be your kind of exercises okay so, uh, so uh, if there is an injury or any other health issue that is other than cancer okay so the first thing of course is to help you get over that injury uh, to rehabilitate that injury which is in the immediate timeline but the more important aspect of this kind of a training is to get you back to your functional capacity pre injury what happens is that sometimes when we have an injury the injury post physiotherapy and once you have done that basic minimum that needs to be done you may be pain free but what happens is that when you try to replicate this movement any time very often you'll hear people say that the pain comes back you know uh, for example if it's a back ache or for example it's oh, a knee injury or a shoulder good. injury i was very good till the time i was doing physiotherapy but over a period of time what happened was that the pain is back and now uh, my range of motion has reduced i'm not able to again lift up my arm so the whole purpose of a training or uh, understanding this kind of a physiology is that you're able to regain as much control as possible over your body its functions its range of motion as it was prior to that injury or prior to that condition with cancer do you know uh, there's a very interesting observation with you that many people who were very uh, sedentary and unfit before they got the cancer diagnosis and when they saw what cancer does to the body and when they took charge of their lives they say that they are now way fitter than what they were before they were they had cancer so i met a few people at the pinkathon they come for the marathon their cancer breast cancer survivors so that's what they said we never ran before we were exactly. diagnosed but so you're fitter yeah. now you're, you're fitter you're, now you, you are make a cancer the survivor you're a cancer yeah. survivor but probably you are the fittest that you've ever been in your yeah. life so that should answer the question what this kind of a training does and it's really uh, like what i say it's training for life 
it is not training for events or training for a thing. You train for life. When your body is in control, your emotions are in control. Your mind is in control. And they feed off each other. And that is when you become a healthier version of yourself. So you're looking at a bigger picture than just the cancer and handling the cancer or whatever. You're looking like at I said, person. cancer is one thing that happens to a person. And it could be a cascade that cancer starts, but cancer is one thing that happens to a person. And I'm also trying to uh, probably uh, downplay the demon we are making of cancer yes. in our minds. That's Treat true. it like that. I, I would have pollen. I could have got multiple sclerosis. I could have got Parkinson's. I could I could get cancer. I can get... There are just so many ailments out Ooh. there waiting to get... Cardiovascular. I could get yeah. anything. Yeah. I could get... But whatever it is that I get, I have to be very focused that I'm not going to let it defeat. I'm bigger than my problem, basically. Yeah. So there is another question. Do you think diseases like cancer can be treated with these traditional techniques? Uh, Which means not, not mainstream. Anything that is not, I mean, cancer just needs aggressive medical treatment. Okay, so that's uh, that's treading on very thin ice, and that's not something that I would like to say a yes or a no to. They both have a role to play. Uh, when you need medical treatment, you should get it. I would not say that you know whatever whatever system of medicine, whether it's traditional or modern, that you're following. Uh, when you need a system of medicine, please go ahead because there is really no point in unnecessarily increasing the timeline of a disease. If it's helping you to mitigate that timeline and if it is helping you to get out of it a little sooner, by all means do it. But should you only go modern and should you not look at uh, the vast repository of uh, uh, you know alternatives, I would again say... No, now we have enough empirical evidence to say that a lot of the alternative stuff is working. So many cancer survivors and so many cancer support groups will stand up and tell you that they work. Right. So you, as an individual, this question needs to be answered as an individual. I would not want to do a gross misservice by uh, saying a yes or a no for the entire cancer community because everybody's cancer is very different. Their body's response and their treatments are very different. Sure. So you see what works for you. The reason for these, for all these talk shows is simply for you to have more information. Make an informed yes, decision. Absolutely. Listen to everything there is. Maybe even study it. Do a little research. Speak to people. Everyone's willing to help you if you're here with a question. And then make an informed decision. Yes. So that but I'm not, I'm, I'm not dismissive. I'm just saying that, you know, don't be dismissive of anything. Right. Like you summed it up very well. Do your homework. Do your study. Try things out for yourself. But please be safe and intelligent about it. Always. Uh, you mentioned something in your talk, uh, Vani, about you are enough for you. You are all you need. You are all you need. Yes. It I sounds agree. really beautiful. But uh, can you elaborate a little? You are all you need. It's, it's really lovely. But if somebody is going through a bad phase and you're going through a disease, how, how do, I mean, it just sounds empowering. Can you give us more about that? So that uh, came about from my own personal experiences. Of course, they don't uh, compare to cancer. And uh, uh, like I said, when I used to watch my mother for uh, 14 long years, uh, such a strong willed yeah. woman, but completely, completely destroyed and ravaged uh, by a disease. And uh, over this course of life, I've also seen people who have been afflicted by a lot less. But I see their over-the-top response, like life has ended for them. So, you know, it, it just puts a lot of things in perspective for me. And I realize that, like I said, your body is your biggest ally. It is such a complex piece. And your mind, my God, your mind is, it, when they say that your mind is capable of moving mountains, what does this mean? It's the mountain that you have created inside your head. It's the mountain of a body not obeying you, which is... Uh, you know, glued your feet to the ground and is causing you to sink in. Where, who's going to lift you up out of it? You, you may have a caregiver, you may have an exercise program, you may have a doctor, you may have an alternate treatment. At the end of the day, what is it that moves the needle for you? You. So you are all you need. The day you have the conviction that you are going to give it the best shot, no matter what, 
I don't know the percentage of the recovery, but 100% there will be some improvement in your present condition. And that is going to leave you so empowered. And like I said, you know, I'm a huge, if I were to come down to a little bit more myopic approach, I'm, I've always been a huge fan of body weight workouts. Because, you know, body parts keep conking off one by one. Yeah, injury, okay, why injury, okay, something happens. And you're not always going to be looking for an equipment or you're not always going to be going for a diathermy session. At the end of the day, that joint and muscle has to move the way you want it to move. So it's all within you. It's all within you. You have to block it. Your body can turn against you, but if you make your body toe the line, your body will also become your biggest ally. And that is what I feel about the healthy lifestyle. You know, the more you pump in to your system, that tomorrow the forces don't turn against you, they kind of obey you as much as they can when a foreign party, which is a virus or a disease, strikes. So you are all you need. Everything is out there for your consumption, but who's going to put it in your mouth for you? You, you don't need anything else. You, you need support, but you are the mover and a shaker for yourself. You have to get up, wake up, own that fact. The day you own that fact, you own yourself and you have already started winning your battle. I'm a huge believer in that. Thanks. Let the naysayers go to hell. That is such a huge positive <laughs> movement, really. Eventually, if you are all you need, then you have all the help you need. Yes. You just need to look out for the help. You need to get that support in. You need to do it for yourself, but you've got to make up your mind. I love your passion, Vani. There's just so much of passion and energy in what you believe in. I think it just flows out to everybody who must be. So, watching. you know, energy, uh, what what are we? That's that's an alternative way of thinking. At the end of the day, we are all energy. energy when yeah. we meditate, when we chant, when we do anything alternative, what are we doing? We're working on our energy. So you are all you need, isn't it? It's the energy within you that's going to, do, you know, decipher color and uh, decide the energy around you. Why do we say that? walk away from something or somebody whose energy does not vibe well with yours. Exactly. It's all within you. Right. You make all your choices. And you've Absolutely. got to make wise choices. You have to look around. You have to get the right information and make the best choices. And Vani has given us another, another option. Lots of things to think about. So this was wonderful, Vani. There was just, I think it's, we will help if there are any questions or anything from our viewers, by, when we put the video out, we shall come back to you and sure. ask help us sure. how it goes. Sure. And I'm sure there's a lot of information for them to do. We've put out your website and things. So if somebody reaches out to you directly, please, you can help them as well. This was a wonderful session. So much to think about, so much information. Thank you so much. I'm Thank sure you it's so much. A lot of positive. And, uh, what you are doing is so much needed. And I really hope the word gets out there. And really, kudos to you and your team. It's Thank you. what you're doing. Absolutely. Thank and you. it's my privilege to be here. And I'm, ex I'm very, very happy. Thank you. Thank you. We were so happy to have this conversation with you. And to add this to our list of all that we can offer to the viewers and whatever that they can work with. This is a very important area that they should know about. And I hope we can really spread the word as far as we can. Thank you so much, Vani Baba. Thank you. Thank you. So to everybody here, thank you so much for being with us. Leave your questions if you're watching this after we are gone and we will get back to you. Thank you, everyone.